<laughs> you know. Well, welcome to the Zoom here, Golf Talk Friday afternoon. We've got uh, Steve Pate, Champions Tour, PGA Tour, and Jim Petrolia, uh, golf coach extraordinaire. And I think part of the, and I'm glad, you, thanks for joining us, guys, really. This is fun. Um, yeah. There's a lot of alchemy here, you know, uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I think kind of where I was hoping to go with this a little bit is about your guys' relationship, uh, which started somewhere in the late 70s at Montecito Montes Country Club in Santa Barbara, California. Um, just for those viewers who, you know, may watch this down the road, uh, Steve Pate, uh, PGA Tour, uh, six or seven, seven tour wins. Um, Nah, that sounds good. Six. That sounds good. Sounds close enough. Uh, over 70 top 10 finishes on the PGA Tour. Um, a lot of good golf. Uh, but and, and Jim Petrolia, uh, to those who don't know, uh, a top 50 uh, teacher in the United States and the world, maybe, and uh, voted by his peers. Um, uh, Hall of Fame instructor in, in California, which there's been a few of those. Uh, been a few instructors standing around less than T's, but not many people uh, get get to that uh, nomination or vote. Um, and uh, and where does this relationship start? Santa Barbara, right? I mean, that's the, right. you're you're going to San Marcos High School, and somehow you wander into the Montecito Cart Barn or something like that. Is that where this starts? Yeah, yeah. I grew up playing at Montecito. Yeah, you know, when I was nine or ten years old, and. Uh, Ended up working there. As soon as I, as soon as I got my driver's license, I needed to put gas in my car. Yeah, so I, needed, exactly. I had to get a job, and I was working at Montecito. When, uh, and and Jim, uh, Jim, how did that do? Why Steve Pate? Were you just taking uh, anybody I, that would sign I got up? The job. I didn't plan. Try to you know try to get to the tour, playing many tours and stuff. And and uh, a good friend of mine called me up, said there's a guy in Santa Barbara looking for a pro. He wants somebody who can teach and play with the members. So that that suited me and. And then he added, you're about done playing, so you might as well go get a job. <laughs> so I did. Okay. Close friend, I'm sure. <laughs> so I did. And uh, Steve was already working there in, in the <laughs> barn in the back room and stuff. And, and I just have to say this, the first week or so there, uh, on a, after a weekend, a busy weekend, uh, none of the carts would run. They were all out of juice because uh, they didn't, do their job over the weekend of watering the batteries. And so when I, I got, got there and tried to avert the tragedy or whatever. And I, I'd asked Steve, I said, uh, what happened? Why didn't you do that? He said, well, you didn't tell me to. Yeah. You're in charge. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> That's classic because I didn't even know that had to be done. <laughs> Coaching moment. Number one, you know, and doing a little bit of research here and, and, you know, uh, in a full disclosure, um, I've known you both for quite a long time, and uh, we have a lot of things sort of Southern California. I grew up in San Gabriel, actually grew up closer to Temple City High School than I did San Gabriel High School, uh, played some sports in Temple City, played some baseball there. Um, Jim, you, you're from Temple City originally, I believe, attended Temple City yeah. High School. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd like to start with you a moment, because most people may not know the pre-golf gym, uh, you attended Temple City High School, you played basketball and football? Right, I was a little better in football than basketball. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, and you know, because I played a little bit of football, I actually uh, played some Pop Warner against the Rams. Uh, Donnie <laughs> Roberts was a big foe, a pretty superstar there in, in my young days as a football player. Um, they had a tremendous football program. And I think you were one of the guys that started that off. With Was that Hitchcock when he came in? Yeah, it was Hitchcock's first year, and I was the uh, I was on their first championship team, and we had uh, uh, we won the league by beating uh, South Pasadena High School 41-40. to 40. Wow, an exciting uh, game. I, okay. I ran into a guy about two years ago in the middle of nowhere who was probably 85 years old, and he, he looked at me and he says, I know you. You're the quarterback at Temple City. I saw the 41 to 40 game. <laughs> That's that awesome. Strange. But anyway, it was a great time for me. I was very lucky. And that began a, a string of where they might have won 12 to 15 CIF championships. Well, and, and for many years, they I don't know whether the team up here uh, has beaten that record, but uh, they had won like they won like 74 straight games at one point of 75 straight games. I was, 
I, I was, uh, I coached there one year. Uh, I think it was 19 when they, it was in the middle of the streak, but it was the first time they won the CIF. And then I think they won 42 or three. And then De La Salle is the team that won all the games. Up there. Yeah, right. Later on. Yeah. yeah. But Hitchcock had quite a program. And, and I remember that quite vividly as, you yeah. know, I was coached by some Marine guys over in St. Gabriel that, right. uh, you know, and, and so it was very, uh, you know, quite an impressive program, huh? John Spacious. And- yeah, it's John Satius, but I, the Lopez brothers were my young okay. Pop Warner coaches, and they coached down at the Pendleton base, so they yeah. had us all crew cut it out and, and organized. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, I think that's interesting for you, Jim. You were a two-sport guy. You, you get to Cal State Los Angeles or L.A. State, and you play football there on a pretty impressive football team, right? And you play quarterback yeah, We had a good ball. program for, for three years. When, when I went there, we weren't very good. I, I was being recruited by Cal. I thought I was going to go. And I, amazingly enough, I qualified to go there grade-wise, which was a shock to my system. Okay. And uh, then I finally got a letter. It said, sorry, we're only taking one quarterback uh, this year. And uh, I figured out later who it was. They took Craig Morton. Who had a oh, reasonable who is he? NFL and so they <laughs> apparently, they, apparently they knew what they were doing. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I think the right oh, well. guy. That fickle finger of fate. But you and you played two ways at, at LA State as well. High school. Did you play D B as well? Yeah, we had uh, in high school they made me play defense halfway through the season because we were getting killed and they didn't want to and, and the fellas that were back there were worse than me, so they put me in. But I, I ended up being a uh, halfway decent defensive back, uh, and and then you, team, which makes a big difference. If you have a good team, you're, it's easier for you. Now I don't know much about this. I know you played on the golf team at LA State, and I don't think people really realize this. In the '60s, I think LA State was probably the best college golf team around. I mean, or pretty close to see if not better, right? We finished second in the NC2As to the University of Houston. Uh, I think my junior year. Yeah, I wasn't really a big part of that. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I was a fourth or fifth man, and because I was, you know, I was, I only played the matches. I never played any other time. Yeah, so we had some good guys. A couple guys played the tour, and Arnie yeah. Duck was a public yeah. playing champion. That kind of stuff. So we had some good players. But but the, but the interesting thing about that is I, what I'm trying to bring this around is. You, you're suddenly playing with some very good players. You're starting to see pretty good golf. As a guy that's playing football, and, right. and suddenly you're starting to be around, some, you know, what is it is to be athletic uh, with golf. And I have a funny story about athleticism and golf that you told me one time down the road. But, but you begin to see what, what good golf really looks like, right? And, and suddenly you're going, wait a minute, if I yeah, focus on this helpful. a little bit. Right. Well, and I uh, learned by playing with those guys and against those guys because we played, we played Stanford, Cal, San Jose, SC, UCLA. We played everybody. Yeah. And, you know, and I, for me, it was a, a lark because, you know, I wasn't a country club kid or anything. And I, and uh, I was just out there making it up as I went along. And, and, uh, I, yeah. I, I, der- I derived a great pleasure on occasion when I would beat some of those guys. Yeah. And, and, and I, but I, so, so I think it's, it's interesting as a coach, I mean, you're, you, you have actually a teaching, a teaching credential, right. <laughs> you know, a lot of us that go professionals. I mean, I, I majored in Japanese politics at UCLA. <laughs> I don't know what that's really, really? Done. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that's really done for my uh, golf game. Uh, I can tell you a little bit that. about the uh, Tokugawa period and some other things, uh, and maybe the. Uh, well, that was, the it was helpful to have that education. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I got a little anatomy and physiology and some of that stuff, and and uh, you know, so I got I had a little better background than most guys. And, and yeah, and you come about it with 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 some skill on how to learn and how to help people learn and so that kind of brings me up to speed so now you're at Montecito you've 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 zipped around and how what year is it since 79 so you went out and after college you, you taught for a little while as you told me you did some sub teaching did you ever teach full-time or was it just subbing at that point did uh, you teach full-time oh I taught uh, high school I taught for six years yeah so you were six years okay yeah, and, was PE teacher. and you were coaching at TC a little bit too. I, I well, I I was coaching. I, I I was teaching at a place called Hacienda Heights Wilson, and I, I I got disenchanted with the football. I was an assistant, and so I I gave that up, and I went one year to Temple City and, and was an assistant on their first CIF championship team. No doubt because of me, but yeah, uh, but well, anyway, no, that- and, 
then I taught for a couple more years. I started playing more golf when I got out of the football coaching and, and I got better and played some of the amateurs and stuff, qualified for a couple of amps. And yeah, I just got better. And some, a friend said, uh, why don't you turn pro? You know, this many tours are going on. You can always yeah. go back to work. Yeah. And so it was kind of still kind of a, a lark. And uh, yeah. I, I was lucky because the minute I started, I was I did pretty well. Yeah. And I beat I won a couple of tournaments against real good fields guys that uh, that Steve would know, Pooley and Gilder and and uh, Fuzzy Zeller was playing and Litsky and Bill Rogers. A lot of those guys somehow they had a golf course I could play. I, I found a golf course that I was really good on because I shot like 19 under a couple of times, which is which was low in those days. Yeah, it was low. They, they went on, you know, they were 10 years younger and they went on to become, have real, yeah, right, right. I wasn't quite there because I was, was in that, my 30s. Was that over in Arizona? Yeah, yeah, that was, I was, I was real good in Scottsdale. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, Steve, maybe you guys have cities. I mean, Steve's been awfully good in San Diego. It seems yeah, to, if no I can find your city, you can play well and keep going no, back. No <laughs> doubt <laughs> about that. He's probably good. So, so now we get to 1979, you're in Montecito, you meet Steve Pate. And, and here we are so many years later, and we still have a teacher-coach, uh, player-coach relationship. And um, so how does this start off? I, I, I think what I, I talked, uh, talked to John, Steve's brother, uh, another very fine golfer. And one of the things you did, and I think as our fellow professionals, we probably don't do enough, you, you played a little bit with Steve, right? You go out and play golf with him? Once, once I figured out how to get somebody to work in the golf shop so I didn't have to be there, I started – one of my jobs was to play golf with the members, and I did. I actually played with about 100 of them in two years. Yeah. But I, I played quite a bit with Steve in the afternoons. We had yeah. Fred Shoemaker there, and Fred and I played once in a while. Yeah. And uh, I think – I, I wasn't teaching him or to tell him anything. I think playing with me uh, was uh, good for him uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that, uh, well, both he and John, I, I wouldn't give him a six inch pot. And, yeah. You know, I wanted to learn how to play. Still won't. The real game. Still, still not. I don't care if that thing bounces off the cup. You're going to make it. Okay. And, no, and so I think that was, you know, that was good. And, and uh, for them, yeah. it was good for me. It, and stuff. And when we started, I probably could have given Steve three aside because he'd always get upset, you know, and start throwing clubs and stuff. No. And in no. the short two years or so, when he was getting ready to go to college, I'd say we were a lot closer to even. And I was, you know, I won the state open at that time. So. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about that. I mean, there is a, you know, knowing both of you, you guys have a, a very dry, rather acerbic sense of humor. Um, and it's usually self-directed. Um, but, uh, the, the, you know, and, and this is, I'm going to get into Steve here a little bit, yeah. you know, Steve, it, it, been around you for a long time. One of the things I find really fascinating about you is that, uh, you know, we know we, this may be somewhat famous to other people, this vol volcano, uh, nickname that you have, but it, off the golf course is not even close to that or anywhere and anywhere near that. But there's one thing that you, you. It, whether you know it or not, in a few stories, that's the time I've spent with you, you have a very keen eye for what really good golf is. I mean, most guys know, see good golf and they're around it, but you, you really understand what good golf is. And so there's this moment, Jim, uh, a very big moment in life. He, he wins the 1979 California State Open and, a, and uh, you know, long list of great players. Walter Hagen, I think, won the California State Open along with Smiley Quick. I mean, we can go on to Jim Free. I mean, a lot of great players in the old days and working on into the into the newer age. A lot of great players have won that tournament. So it's quite a moment. Jim's driving back. You caddied for him. Pretty proud. Jim says, what did you learn anything this week? And Jim, what does Steve say to you? He said, well, I figured out you don't have to hit the ball worth a damn to win a golf tournament. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, as an 18 year old, I thought I it was as good as I could hit it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, but you know, that's, that's a pretty insightful thing to, I mean, I wish I could get that across to my juniors that, you know, it's a sum of the parts. It's not just any one great one moment. Absolutely. Right? I'm sure right. I put it rather well that week. <laughs> of course. I did a lot of things really well. I mean, it's, it's funny. I wasn't trying to be a dick. That was I know that. I know that about you. You don't have to try. That's right. It comes <laughs> natural. Right. But, you know, that was really fortunate for me when Jim started working at Montecito to be able to play with somebody who who plays well. Right. And, and of course. 
Yeah. Local guys who you think play well really don't. Right. Exactly. You know, Jim, Jim had done things and won tournaments. And yeah, exactly. I got yeah. To see, and I got to see what it was like. And that, what? and that year at the State Open when he won, I mean, I was sitting there watching guys. You know, Jim won the tournament, and there were a lot of good players there. That was – that was second level, really, professional golf at the time. That was comparable to Cornford. Yeah, very, yeah, very, yeah, very much so. And I, I didn't see anybody that I, mean, I saw a lot of people that were better players than me, but I didn't see anybody that couldn't do anything that I could do. There you go. So, there you go. Just yeah, and I, you know, I'm I'm going to jump ahead here. I mean, I, and I'm going to share two moments with you. Uh, you know, and this gets a little ahead, but. Um, Jim relayed a story to me one time when you first got your card. Was it 84, Steve, Tour School? Yes. Right? 84, Tour School. Tour school. Um, uh, and uh, so 84, Tour School, you get your card. Uh, you're out on tour. Did n not instant success. Been out there several months. You're talking to Jim over the phone. He tells me one day, yeah, I was just talking to Steve, and how does that go? He goes, well, I keep asking him, is he playing with anybody that's any good? And he says, well, you know, I play with some guys that are so-so. And he, finally, Jim says, uh, you say to him, yeah, I played with somebody that's pretty good today. And, he, and, and, and Jim says to you, well, who is that? He goes, well, it was Ray Floyd. You know, and, and I mean, if, if I've been out on tour, for, and most guys out on tour for three, four months would say, well, everybody's pretty damn good. But, you know, you, Ray Floyd made a difference. I mean, that, you discernibly saw something different. And I think, you know, it's interesting. When I think of Ray Floyd, I do think of some of the characteristics that all both of you have, which is very competitive, gets the job done, stays pretty focused on the golf course. And, and another one is in 90, early 90s, we're playing Sherwood together. And I asked you, anybody on tour that you find kind of off the radar or pretty, pretty impressive? And you said, yeah, there's this guy named Payne Stewart that suddenly will just pop up and shoot 28, 29, 30 on a nine and put himself in a position to win a golf tournament out of nowhere. He does it all the time. And I, at that point, I hadn't thought much about Payne Stewart. So you do have a keen eye going back to 79 of what really good golf is more so than most. And I think that is that moment that you, you know, we talk about your, your temper and things. You, I, I think you really understand what it, what it mean, means to play really good golf. And I think that's been a trademark of you for a very long time. So now we're at 79, we're, in Montece we're at Montecito. You transfer to UCLA freshman year in 1980, you get to UCLA. We're, I think, maybe in the history of college golf, on paper, one of the better teams ever played the worst as any team could possibly play in 1980 for a team on paper. You look at it. I mean, how many tour wins do we have from that team on 1980? There's quite a few, huh, Steve? We were underperformers, yes. We're underperformers, right, by, by, by no mean. But – Let's talk about your college career. You get there, Steve, you know, and, and I'm going to get into swing a little bit. And this starts your relationship. At what point does Jim start coaching you, really, as far as golf swing, golf game? And it, was it about your freshman year of college? Or? I think it was sophomore year. I played pretty indifferently my freshman year. I played terrible my sophomore year. Yeah. I, I never had much of a golf swing to begin with. I just hit it hard and putted well. Yeah. Uh, it became apparent that wasn't good enough. Yeah. So, and Jim was becoming a very good teacher and was teaching a lot at the time. Yep. And I knew he'd been studying and this and that. So I called him. He was over at Annandale. And yeah. I would drive over every Thursday. And yeah. the results showed up quickly. Um, yeah. If I was terrible, this was probably spring quarter, sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And by junior year, I was decent. Really decent. Um, I mean, your golf swing, as I recall it, big forward press, dr club dragged in pretty quickly, got up, maybe a little across the line, and slam, yeah. you know. And that was freshman year when I played with you. Uh, you got it done. I mean, I'm, I will say, you know, you, you could get it done. But, I mean, by the way, I mean, the rumor was, that, I mean, I think your senior year in high school, you averaged like 34 for nine holes in matches. Uh, Eddie saw something in you, obviously. You you came in as a pretty highly recruited player. I think other schools might have been interested in having you, even with your. And by the way, folks, if you're listening in, if people listen to us, the, the depth self deprecation here will be pretty large if you speak to either one of these fellows. You can hear more. I hit a bad shots and see 68 on the scorecard at the end of the round with these two guys, and I've seen it a hundred times. So, but you know, you were getting the job done, and then in sophomore year you start making some swing changes. Jim, what do you what, what do you remember about those early days and swing changes? 
Um, I just, uh, I, I didn't know that much about what I was doing, but, I, you know, I dragged it in there and Hatsy Lopez and, and stuff and lifted it. And so I started to get him on plane and mm -hmm. uh, I did real, something real simple, had him stick the club in his belly and, and just pivot, leave it alone with his hands. And it started to help him. So he'd get to the position two or whatever you want to call it. The first, the first parallel, he started to get on plane and I got a lot of compliments from guys, uh, fairly soon they said boy you really helped him you know and I asked one Greg McCatton who you know who's a brilliant yeah. instructor and I and I, I whispered to Greg I says what did I do yeah you know so uh, as we went along it, it things developed and stuff and what's interesting to me 40 some odd years later is what still plagues him as he gets it inside and he lifts it up and yeah, yeah. Die hard. that much you know yeah no that, that is true I live and die with who we started with yeah in terms of a golf swing and you just as a coach you just try to get it somewhere in the ballpark so right yes because he can do something with it right uh, he's close yeah he's he can do something with it yeah so so walk me through uh, has a lesson platform or how you guys do lessons together has that changed over the years anyway? Like like a standard lesson, Steve shows up, does he say, I've got an issue? Do you talk, has it always been about ball flight or is there anything in particular that you've seen or you're matching ball flight, club face, whatever? How, how does it go for you, Jim? I think early on, I was I was probably more assertive, you know, because I was an adult and he was still young and yeah and stuff. And uh, But I knew, I mean, I knew when, when I was in Santa Barbara and I, play with John and Steve, people would say, don't you think John is better? And I, I said, no, you don't know what you're looking at, you know? And, and uh, even though I was looking at their golf swings, uh, Steve's competitive stuff was just what it takes, what it really yeah, right. takes. Exactly. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's changed very much. I, else I might see him tomorrow and I've seen him a week ago or whatever. And, I, you know, kind of watch him. I listen to him a little bit he's a little bit more in charge now in terms of what he wants to do. And because he understands his body, it's different. He's not a kid anymore. Right. And stuff. And, uh, but I'm, I'm always trying to get the thing in the same, you know, on the plane and get the face working good and have some hit on it. Right. And that's anytime we have a good session, usually he'll, he'll say something. No, that's, you know, that, that feels good. I think I can do that. Right. You know, and that's and most important. Right. And is that where it, it kind of ends? And then we, we go on and, 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 oh, you know, I, Steve I is tried off the battle. I'll give you a, a perfect example. One year I caddy for him in Milwaukee. He wasn't doing very well up to that point in the year. And, and he had me come back and I was going to caddy. And at the end of two rounds, he's kind of in the hunt. And uh, third round was a little sluggish. And, and I think I, I said he was on the putting green. We're teeing off in 10 minutes. I said, well, I got to go to the restroom. So I, I went in there and I took a scribbled on a piece of paper, uh, some highly motivational stuff about everybody loves you. Don't worry about what happens today. All this philosophic. Right, right. Stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I, I said, I handed it to him on the putting green. I said, here, why don't you take a look at this? He says, well, I got to go to the restroom. And when he came back, I said, did you read it? He said, no, I used it for something else. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. I well, I don't, I don't think motivating Steve has ever been a big, you know, I, I'm going to switch back here because, uh, you know, Steve, I was the, I played with you as a senior and then I came back as, as sort of a bag boy assistant coach several years later in your senior year. And I, I will say this, that there was something that flipped, there was a, a switch that got flipped in you that went from, I'm just, I'm playing on a college golf team to being very focused, very, and, and pretty much the most dependable guy if I needed something done on the team. Uh, and I, I am flipping here back, but what was that that changed in that? Or was that just had you had you made a decision? I've never really asked you this. Hey, you just made a decision. I got to get my stuff together if I'm going to keep doing this. What was it that changed for you? Was there was there something? Because you had a great yeah. senior year. I mean, I always kind of knew was trying to get my stuff together. Um, once I worked some swing issues out with Jim, and I got to playing well enough where I was pretty sure I had a future at this point. Yeah. Well, that became my focus. I didn't um, yeah. 
You know, had ac ac academics was not my major focus when I was there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> we because had one talk where I, I told him, he hadn't really ever expressed it to me, but I said, I know exactly what you want to do with the rest of your life. You want to play the tour. And I think in some ways that was good for him because uh, a lot of us are afraid to say things like that. Yeah. That we really want to do. And, and uh, so I think that may have affirmed it and maybe in his own mind. And I think he and Sherry came to see uh, me together at the mm -hmm. same time. But Sherry probably had a lot to do with his maturation also. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it helped. We got married the week after we graduated college. Yeah, right. It's been nice to have somebody supporting me the whole time. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. I think we, I think from the outside looking in for those who haven't played golf full time and tried to, you know, make it work. Um, it, it can get a little lonely, and, you know, all by yourself out there. We kind of think it's a little bit different, but we're sort of isolated doing our own thing out there playing golf and having a support system like Jim here. And that's kind of what we're talking about as Sherry has been for you as well. Those are really important factors. I mean, having that stuff together makes life trying to get a ball in a a hole as, as low as you possibly can week after week, more accessible. Let's put it that way. So we get on tour, uh, 84. Steve is uh, all American at UCLA. He wins the PAC 10 championship at LA Cubby club. I'm there. He ties another player named Sam Randolph, I think for that victory, uh, who was a, a freshman. We, we know of Sam Randolph, another Santa Barbara lad, a very fine player himself. And, you get you go to the tour finals that year in '84. Is that when you got your card? Is '84 in the finals? '84, yeah. So '85 was my first year. Twice. Yeah. So '84, it was at Mission Hills. We we actually played a few practice rounds together. Uh, yeah, like, like a hundred of them. <laughs> like a hundred of them. You mean, remember, remember the remember the ninety holes that you could not make a bird? Was that you? <laughs> yeah, no. Surfy and I we we played like nine, like thirty rounds of golf and you couldn't make a skin. And finally, you made like thirty on the last hole or carryover, but. Uh, yeah, and, you know, that says something about you is your persistence, and I'll bring something up about, the, about that tour school. You and I are playing practice rounds, and we're playing Mission Hills, and in the first 14 holes, you've topped like seven tee shots. And you look at me and go, Greg, what's going on? I go, I don't know. I, I can't believe it. And they're not bad. They're down the fairway, but they're just not very sweet. Now, I look up. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if you remember. We played the Mexican Open the week before. Yeah. You were down there, weren't you? Too yeah, I was. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I shot about 155, and I missed a cut by a million. I was looking to see if I could get my money back from Q School, <laughs> but I couldn't, so I played anyway. <laughs> so we're down there. Yeah, we're down at tour school. You're topping tee shots, and just fast forward to round five, I look up, and there's Steve Payton leading the golf tournament. So, you know, I think that says something about you and your persistence and your ability to kind of get it together. Um uh, I think you finished third or fourth there at tour school, right? Uh, Seekman one, maybe. I think, I, think I finished fourth, yeah. Fourth, yeah. And by the way, if people want to go back and look, the guys that got their tour tour card, uh, Sluman, and there's a whole slew, Azinger. I mean, there's quite, it was quite a good tour school. So you get out on tour uh, uh, with a Tiger B game, I guess, right for the week. I don't know how you did that top and tee shots, but you do. Um, uh, and and that's a little bit of a trademark of yours is trying to you know you get the job done. So, um, and, and by the way, the, the swing over the years, and I'm going to keep talk, coming back to this, it's gotten better and better and better. So um, we get out on tour, maybe not some early success. What was going on between you two at that time, getting out on tour and maybe not quite having immediate success? Anything? I'm sorry, between Jim and I? Yeah, between you and Jim, yeah. I was just, for, from my perspective, I was just continuing to do the same things because I, I thought it was the right thing. I yeah. saw signs of promise. Yeah, right. I yeah. didn't play very well the first four months and then finished second. Yeah, and then you had a second. Where was that? Where was that? Where was the second? Uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. Did you, you know? I, I, I had faith in what we were doing. That was the Bell South, right, or something like that? Yeah, I think it was at the time, yeah. Yeah, he had. Yeah, I was. I'd been. I was a little disappointed. I mean, I'd follow him, but I wasn't traveling with him at all in, the, in those days. And and uh, but I would. I went out. I took my son up to the river and for uh, you know, whatever you, those things you jump on and ride around the lake in and and stuff. And then he, uh, I, I hadn't paid attention. I was away from everything. And then I got a call. And he said he finished second in a tournament, which was a thrill for me because that kind of guaranteed him 
staying out there. Right. You know, and stuff. And I think, you know, that's, that's kind of what it takes is you've got to find a way to prove that you can do this against the best. And I think, yeah, I don't know if you, I think you might've been paired with Raymond Floyd then. I don't recall. Yep. In that tournament. And uh, cause I think I asked him the question about Floyd or something. I said, well, what do you think of him? He said, well, he's pretty good. Yeah. That's an insight right there. Because yeah, exactly. He was exactly. more than pretty good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he was, I, you know, you played in some events and I played uh, tour events yeah. and stuff. And I was, I, I, I hitting balls on a range one day between Gabe Brewer and Ray Floyd. And I knew I didn't belong there. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was the difference. Yeah, and, St and Steve, Steve, Steve feels like he belongs there, and that's always been sort of a trademark. And uh, you know, so that, they weren't that much better, but but uh, I sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you, big big thing. So we, we keep our card in '84, '85. You lose a playoff, or did you win in '85? Right? Did you win in '85? No, no. '87. No, okay, so we're out there for a few years. We keep working on the same stuff. Anything during that time, any game change for you? Anything going on with your game that you could remember that was just getting no, used to? I yeah. just kept getting better at what I was doing. Yeah. I didn't try to do anything different. Foot, footnote to anybody, there's only two guys I know in the history of my professional career that are practicing anymore that I personally knew. Uh, maybe VJ Singh, which I don't know, but I know he practiced a lot, and this man, Steve Pate. So I, I will say that he outworked just about anybody – out there. I, I think, Jim, would you safely say that's pretty close to the truth? Well, when I started going out on the road with him, uh, you know, I was quite a bit younger. Uh, I, he wore me out. Yeah. It would be, a, a, you know, an hour on the range, 18-hole practice round, another hour on the range, uh, an hour on the putting green, some, maybe some more chipping, and maybe even then hit some more balls. And uh, yeah. people say, oh, it must be fun to go out there. Well, yeah, it is in a way, except, you know, I'm dragging. Yeah, exactly. He works hard. Uh, and all this stuff. No, he worked so hard. There were times when I wanted him to quit. The British Open one year is blowing about 50 left to right against on the range. And I knew why, because it was a Ryder Cup year and he wanted to make the team. But this is 91. In addition to get some, some points, I don't remember, but, but he's hitting a driver for about 45 minutes into this win. And he's nine out of 10 are perfect, and, but he'd hit one off to the right. And, and I said something about, don't you think this is enough? And it kind of typically goes, no, <laughs> no. <Not enough. laughs> and Al is wonderful caddy. We just look at each other and say, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> right. <I'm an> idiot. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so Steve, let's talk about some of the highlights of your career. That's kind of interesting. I think the 91 and 99 uh, Ryder Cups were certainly uh, big moments in your career. Um, you know the '91, uh, the '91 uh, Ryder Cup. So in '88, you have a great year in '88, right? You maybe yeah. one of your better years on tour. '91, maybe you're at, up to that point, probably your best year. You had several top ten finishes. You won. Um, you won in '88. Uh, so at your your, we get. What, what was changing? What was going on in 91? That, that was, so is it just a culmination of this hard work and persistently any swing changes at all guys, anything going on or anything different? Jim, Jim, you're being affected by your, your knowledge is growing because I'm playing a little golf with you in those days. We're talking some O'Grady stuff. We're talking right. some golfing machine stuff. We're talking got, some Mike Hebron stuff. He got 91 was the best he ever swung the golf club at the Ryder cup. He was in, he was better than anybody there. He was the only guy that could shoot anywhere as near par on, the, on Kiowa. Everybody yeah. else is shooting 80 in the practice rounds. And uh, he was right on the money. I mean, he was on plane perfectly. The sequencing was good. He was just the best he's ever been and unfortunately got hurt. Yeah. When you talk about what we try to do, I mean, what I've always tried to do, you're trying to do the three things that matter. You want the club shaft on the plane. You want the face pretty square when the ball is struck and you want, want the club head trailing. And there isn't, yeah. isn't much else to do. How guys do it is personal. And I have opinions that there are certain things I'd always try to improve with him, like his left leg and stuff and his swing. And we never, we never really got where we wanted to, I don't think. And, but some of that is, is personal injuries, inability yeah. to do it. And that's kind of where we're going now is those injuries, right? I mean, and we have this unfortunate uh, – um, I'm sure you don't send many Christmas cards to the, to the driver of that limo, but um, 
you know, we have a little accident and that kind of sets you back. But let's talk about that last match at the Ryder Cup. So you're injured. You're not really, you know, and by the way, here's another mystery to me why you've never been chosen as an, at least an assistant coach. Because I don't know, uh, you played on two Ryder Cups. Both, te both teams have won. You haven't lost too much to the Ryder Cup. <laughs> so they might want to give you a call and go, how do we win one of these things? <laughs> That's a good idea. A good idea. Yeah, don't you think? But anyway, so 91, who do you play? You finally get called in in the last day. And, who, and the match is it's close, right? Who, who well, was it? No, no, no. I played on Saturday. I played, played on Saturday. Okay. Team match record. And we lost to Colin Montgomery, and I don't remember who else. Okay. Sunday, I was supposed to play Savvy in the singles, and uh, I had taken a wrong step on one of those mounds during the round on Saturday, and everything seized up. I was really not optimistic about playing on Sunday, and okay. I tried to hit balls for 20, 30 minutes, and I couldn't hit it 40 yards. Yeah, okay. And you, you had a, it was a hip. Was it part of the hip and the back? Was that what happened? In the it was left side, hip, and abdominals. I, I took a pretty good shot to the side in the car accident. Yeah. It, it was all black and ugly. Yeah, ugly, yeah. And, and you know, there's two other accidents. So so we go on We get, after that year. 91, what happens next? You, you, you keep playing, right? And then – How's the game going in 91 through 94, 95, 93, you know? It wasn't – I mean, it wasn't bad. Well, yeah. That did – I mean, my hip action was never what I wanted it to be anyway, and it got worse after that. Yeah. Uh, just injury, but, I mean, I was still very fun. Yeah, you won 92. You won the San Diego Open, right? Didn't you? Uh, yeah. San Diego, Buick Invitational, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it was – it caused some problems, but nothing major. Nothing major, right. Yeah. And, and so, so this, so Jim, are you spending much time with Steve on the road at this point in coaching or? Yeah, I think uh, there was a, a stretch of years, yeah, where I would go, I went to a lot, a lot of the majors, which was yeah. good. And we, uh, it was interesting because usually when I went out, he'd have a good week. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that that's because of, anything I did, but I think there might have been a uh, security blanket there in some way and, you know, and uh, try to get the work done by Wednesday. And, and I know one year at the Masters on Wednesday, he was the last coming into the ball. Last time the club was parallel uh, to the ground, level of the ground, he was about two degrees into out. If you had track man, that's probably would have been one or two degrees. And I said, boy, I'd like to move that over. And he just looked at me and says, we don't have to do anything. I can hit this thing good from here. And he finished yeah. in the third or fourth, I forget. Right. And so his own sense. And I was just smart enough to say, okay, <laughs> you're the player. Yeah. And so so maybe at this point you're starting to trust his judgment a little bit more, right? I mean, oh, you know, sure. obviously he's a world-class player. You have to. If, you, if you've got somebody, a, somebody, a student coach, especially at higher levels and – and they, their judgment's not very good. They're not going to do very well. I mean, yeah, the player's got to know, right, a right, lot right. About what he does. I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. But but he's he's you know he stayed to this path that you guys set on early. It, it's continuing. He's starting to trust. He obviously the trust is there between the both of you. He's trusting it more and more. He's seen obviously some great results. We get in '96. You win somewhere, and you're driving home, and you get another accident. Huh, Steve? Right. Uh, yeah, you, you, uh, some, we know, uh, that, that one was bad. <laughs> yeah. I that probably, one. I probably should not have lived through that one. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes you several years to get back out of that. I would say, right. I mean, yeah, that, that blinked for a while. It's off the entire year. And I, so that was 96. Yeah. I played in 97 and I was not very good. I played in 98, and I was a little better, and I played in 99. Something clicked. It was a – well, yeah, and it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. But, yeah, I played really well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to ask you about 99. I, I've never asked you this, so I need to bring it up. Uh, what the hell was going on when Duvall shot 59? What were you thinking about? I mean, by the way, you still had a you still had an 18-foot putt to tie him, right? On the, maybe – or was it about 12-foot putt? I mean, this guy shoots 59 on you. I, mean, I didn't. You know, it's funny. I didn't know he shot fifty nine. You didn't? Um, no, I, I knew he played really well. I didn't know what he shot. I didn't care what he shot. 
Yeah, I, exactly. I, it's I, a number, right? Yeah. Right. So, you know, I got in the press room and whatever, and they interviewed me. Some guy who I know, a reporter who I know, I can't remember who it was, said something about, God, don't you think he should have acknowledged David's 59? I said, I had no idea he shot 59. <laughs> Well, you got to get, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you come into the last hole, you hit a great shot in, you got an eagle putt to tie, as I recall. No, no, no. I hit it in the bunker. And you hit it in the bunker? Right okay. Yeah. yeah. It's an indifferent bunker shot to about 12 or 15 feet. Okay. I was, I was down there early in the week, for uh -huh. one or two days, and, and I knew he was looking really good. And uh, one, one day, where I forget where we were, uh, PJ West or something. And I looked around behind me, 20 yards behind me was Mac O'Grady standing there watching. So I walked back to say hello to Mac and how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you think? And Mac went like this. He said, he's right on it. So it was no surprise. Yeah. He played real well. And when I talked to him after the tournament, I didn't go down during the week of the tournament, but before they started playing, and I talked to him that evening, I think, and I said, boy, you played good. He said, well, I could swing as hard as I wanted to, and it wasn't going to hook. Right. In my experience, that's the greatest feeling you can have is right. get after it, and it's not going to hook. Okay, so 99, you're, you have to get comeback player of the year, and you're on the Ryder Cup again. You're a Ryder Cup pick. And who's your partner uh, you're playing in the matches with? There was a guy. Oh, this kid named Tiger. He's pretty Tiger, good. yeah. Yeah, how, how was that? I mean, you know, now when you look back on it. Oh, the ultimate shot was great. I got to hit clubs I'd never hit in my life. <laughs> both, I'm hitting nine irons on holes. I'm hitting four or five iron with my own tee shot. It was great. Yeah, yeah. That must have been quite – that's quite an experience. And where was 99? And so was that at uh, uh, Brooklyn? Brooklyn, Brooklyn yeah. Massachusetts, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, have to, I have to interrupt here because he told me at the beginning of, of 99, he said this is a Ryder Cup year. I want to work really hard because this might be my last chance. I don't know how old he was. You're getting to be 38 or something or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, then a, a month or two in, he's, he's done, he's off to a good start, I think. And then he tells me, he says, I got a chance to get picked by Crenshaw. And I kind of looked at him and I'm thinking, why would Crenshaw pick you? <laughs> <laughs> and he basically said, because he likes me. <laughs> And then later on in the year, he tells me if I play, if I'm on the team, I'm probably going to play with Tiger, you know. And so he kind of had these feelings about what was going to happen and everything. And so it all it all turned out that way. And I recall when I got to Brookline, and the first time I saw Crenshaw, I went up to him and, and we'd met before and all that. And, and I said, boy, I got to give it a lot of credit for picking Steve because he could have taken couples and a few other guys. Steve was ahead of them on the point list, but and he just looked at me. He said, "If I got, if I got, need somebody to make a ten foot putt when it matters, he's my guy." That's true. And that was kind of the deal, you know. And it was. Uh, By the way, even in your senior tour careers, uh, Steve, I, I I couldn't find stats from your regular tour, but just supports Jim's point here. <clears throat> Anytime you play a fourth round or a last round on the Champions Tour, you know that you're. Your putting stroke average goes down about a stroke for the round. No, I did not know that. <laughs> it is true. I, I started looking at it. I go, huh, he's averaging 30.1, 30.1, 30.7, 30.1. Oh, last round, 29.1, 28.7. 20 so you do, you know, that that is a, that is sort of a trademark of yours. And I think that kind of goes back to this, you know, this competitive thing that you that both you and Jim share of just getting the job done. So, um 99. That was quite an experience winning that Ryder Cup, huh? That was pretty amazing. That was. That was – and it was – that last day was like being in a football stadium for six hours. It was loud. It was loud. Any yeah. any memorable shots uh, uh, in that week for you that you remember that you might have hit that were something that you can kind of reflect back on? or which I remember – the one that I remember was on the 15th hole in singles when I was playing a menace. I had a perfect number for a sand wedge, but the grains were soft, and if I hit sand wedge, it's going to spin right off the grain down the fairway. And I had a horrible number for a pitching wedge, but I had to hit it, and I hit it to about a foot and a half. Nice. I, I didn't like anything about the shot, but I hit it to about a foot and a half. Well, you, you Jimenez, Jimenez. 
because <laughs> he tends to do a lot of that stuff, it seems to me. And I'm going to yeah. ask you a little bit about your Champions Tour life. You know, by the way, you're one of the oldest guys to ever win on what we call the Nationwide, Web.com, Corn Ferry. You won at 48 out there in, in 98, so you, you won again and, and playing out there. But you get on the Champions Tour, what year, what, what year, what was your first, 2011? Uh, Yes, 2011. 2011. Um, difference, your, your Champions Tour career, you, you know, what's changed for you a little bit in your game? Anything compared to the other players or anything changed at all, really, for you? Because you're I always pretty consistent. Yeah, I haven't putted very well since I've yeah. been there. Yeah. The biggest issue. Um, yeah. You know, I did, it's funny, after playing – you know, because I played a number of nationwide events for six years. Yes, you did. And playing with the kids and, you know, out of nowhere. You know, when you get old, sometimes you got to make a swing and nothing happens. And right. you might you might hit two inches behind it. And yeah. I thought I was the only one on earth that ever did that until I turned 50 and start playing with other guys that are 50. And <laughs> They're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. Um, so you get out there. I mean – uh, observations of the Champions Tour versus the regular tour. That's one. Guys miss shots a little bit more than they used to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you this. Bernard Langer, what, what's the mystery there? What, what, what separates him from all the other guys on the Champions Tour for you in your mind? Uh, well, I mean, his work ethics. I, at 63 years old, it's amazing how hard he still works. Yeah. I mean, I've seen him out at a golf course on Monday, the day after he won a tournament, the, you know, the week before. And yeah, he's, he's really he's really disciplined, and he doesn't miss many shots. Yeah, he just doesn't, does he? No. You, you think that's – is that – I mean, the swing is fine. What, what, what do you think that is for him? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't go, you know, Bernard Langer is going to be my picture, you know, swing. But. No, I mean, he never has been. And if you look at – compare it now to what it was – it's not the same. He's a, he's been able to adapt to a changing body. Yeah. Even though his body, other than being having some wrinkles, it looks the same as it did 30 years ago. That's true. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, here's a guy who's overcome the yips twice. Exactly. Uh, People don't talk it, about that, do they? Yeah. And I, I, I played with him in Atlanta one year when he was going through the yips for the second time. And he could literally miss from 12 inches. Yeah. And, and, that and he's, over, he's overcome that twice. That's pretty hard to do. Yeah, that is pretty hard to do. So, so there's a strong mind there, uh, and maybe to, to overcome that. Um, Jim, if, if in your career as a coach, looking back on this relationship, just as a coach, whether Steve's in that picture or not, is there something that you would have done differently as a coach, as a, as a teacher, that you wish you could have changed in your coaching technique or something that you might have focused on differently? Uh, well, it's uh, I probably today dealing with younger guys. If you're dealing with younger guys, you've got to use the technology, I think, because that's part of our world today, right? And stuff, but I, I still kind of feel like I can, I can watch it. Um, oh, I could have been a lot better, I suppose. I could have known more and stuff, but in some ways, uh, what I knew was going to work if you could do it, and uh, I think if I would have changed anything I did with him I might have tried to be a little tougher with him about some of the things he would practice because he would we'd go to the practice screen after a round where he didn't putt well <clears throat> and he'd sit there and, and set some balls down six feet from the hole or eight feet from the hole and hit the same putt for an hour and I love to do it on putt. I love to do it where the green was bumpy so you wouldn't yeah and he would do it when the green was beat up and Al would sit down behind the hole and I'd, I'd be watching his stroke and and it was like, why are we doing this? And every once in a while I'd say, Steve, you're only going to have this putt once in your life. And it was basically the same thing I would have said. I don't care. I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, sure, I could have, I certainly could have gained more knowledge. I could have, uh, a lot of things. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I did what I could do. I didn't, at least I didn't try to teach anything I didn't understand. Yeah, I think some young guys uh, try to do that. They try to try to impart wisdom that isn't really wisdom yet. Yes, and uh, you know we all have information. Uh, 
the information so available now you shouldn't you should have pretty good information but it the delivering it and getting somebody to do it is a, is, is a lot more art than it is science yeah it's it's interesting i wanted to back up to what jim was saying about technology because i see not too many guys on the senior tour but i know a lot of the other guys will travel the track now and while it's a useful tool I also see guys, you know, they're trying to get their numbers correct to maximize their driving distance. And right. you know, I hear them say, oh, the numbers were perfect. And I look at the shot, and I go, yeah, but it's out of bounds. Yeah. <laughs> what, what good does that do? You? Right. <laughs> it's, right. A, it's a useful tool, but it's not the end all. The end all. That's exactly right. I mean, right. Well, Zach Johnson's numbers with the wedge, and he's a great wedge player, or nothing you'd ever teach. I mean, he's yeah. way inside out with a shut club face. Right. He wouldn't do that, but yeah, he knows what he does. Exactly, exactly. And he's and he makes good shot selections, good decision making based on what he knows he can do. Right? He's really good at that. It's fantastic. Um, if you, coaching, I mean, if you if you can see something a guy's you know, developing player who's, who's aspiring to be a tour player or whatever, if you can see something that isn't sound and you know it's not going to work, then you've got to try and change that. Right, but I uh, Steve complimented me once and said I was the best snap hook wedge player he'd ever seen, and I thought I was hitting them straight. <laughs> My divots were thirty yards to the right, and they were loved hooking. that shot. It would take one bounce and spin back left. It was and, so cool. <laughs> and, and you know, I got I got rid of that as I got older, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Jim, I, 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 didn't, I didn't I didn't go into your bio, but you know, you, you, you deprecate pretty well. You and I have partnered up on several occasions. Uh, you know, a little footnote to you, which is, I think is pretty, pretty doff to your competitiveness. You're a, you're a player of the year 11 years apart in the senior division in Southern California. That's pretty hard to do as a senior, <laughs> you know, 11 years apart to be yeah, player no, of the year. I, I think well, I some pretty good golfers, right? something to dinner and I said, I'd like to come back in 11 more years and, do, and get this again. But I, unfortunately, <laughs> I, I could only be the super senior. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, well, I'm I mean, sure. again, it's a testament to your competitive nature and your desire to improve and get better, and and uh, that certainly is rubbed off on Steve. I'm still looking for something, you know, I know. That's gonna make me better. I, I there's a there's a reality here that I'm aware of, but I still think I know I got one good round left somewhere. <laughs> well, I you know years ago you you mentioned Annandale. I I had the opportunity to spend some time with Mr. Runyon, Paul Runyon, and. I remember one day driving into the parking lot, I was going to go play nine holes with him in Annandale. And at the point, I think he was maybe 86, 85 or so, somewhere in that range. And he gets out of the car and he runs over to me and he goes, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> you know, he was so excited. And he, you know, he went out and hit two greens and shot one under, I think, or something. Oh, I played know. nine holes with him once and he said, do you want to have a game? And I, I said, well, sure. You know, and he said, well, we're going to play for a dollar. And I'm yeah. a four or something like that. What are you? And I says, well, I'm a zero. And all I did was watch. And it was one of the greatest exhibitions I've ever seen. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Couldn't hit it anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, I just, and, and I think he beat me one up or something. And But I was, it was a thrill to watch him. He was a wonderful guy. Yeah, he really was. Well, no, I, got, I got to play with, uh, with him with you a couple times, Jim. I don't know if you remember yeah. But every time he got in some, within 30 yards of the green, I thought he might make it. Yeah. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and, else. You know, Steve, I want to just talk about that for a moment. You, you know, you, you get out on tour, you play with all these amazing players. Any memorable moments that you've witnessed on tour that you look back and go, well, that was kind of either a shot or a round or, and go – that was kind of amazing. You know, you, you made a comment here, and I'm going to back this up. You were talking to Feinstein. Uh, you're in one of his books somewhere, and you say when tour players get together, everybody's got a tour school story. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm adding that to this mix, and maybe it's not a tour school story for you, but any rounds on the PGA Tour that may have involved you or may have involved somebody else that's rather memorable? You mean besides David Duvall shooting 59? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah, that, you know, Q School, I played in 1984. I'm paired with Wayne Grady. And I don't know if you remember, there's a par three on the front side of the Pinto Hotel. It's, it's de surrounded by desert. It's like an island grass. Yeah, so it's, it's no longer there. Yeah, the dunes course. Yep. Yeah. And he hit it in a bush, and his ball's about three feet off the ground, and he's baseball swinging it, and he flushed it. This ball's going to go 100 yards and down into the desert. He might still be there trying to finish the hole. 
to you know, 25 years, 35 years later, and it wrapped up in the flag and dropped down on the grain. And we made four and got his card. Got his card. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he may never have finished the hole. I thought what happened. Yeah, yeah. That was the year we had that wind delay down there too. Remember the yeah. camping around? Yeah. Remember Sherpy made Sherpy made what fourteen on a hole and went in the wind. They canceled it and came back and made eleven the next day and still shot seventy five. <laughs> That's a great one. Uh, tour school stories. Yeah, um, yeah. You you hope you don't have too many of them. Um, uh, the few the be fewer the better, but the good ones are the, are the good stories. Um, mem shots. Let me ask you this question: memorable shots for you? Shot maybe but, but, but for you maybe a more memorable shot. Any? I had, yeah, the year I, my rookie year when I finished um, second in Atlanta, I lost a playoff to Wayne Levy. The 15th hole was a good good four part. I drove it good, and the pin was back left. And there's nothing about this shot that says you should hit a cut. You're starting it in some crap and cutting it back to this back left pin and hit it to a foot. Yeah. And, and I knew I was going to hit the shot right. And I don't yeah, know why. I just knew it. No. Yeah. That's good. That's how about, how about the shot, is there any shots you'd like to take over? Oh, there's a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one memorable one. Sorry to bring it up. I mean, we're going to end on a more positive note, but one that you might like to take over, you know, that uh, you'd like to – anything? Yeah, I had about? a chance to win at uh, the old Bank of Boston tournament at Pleasant Valley, and I had a downhill, slippery 12-footer that I just really felt like I was going to make. And I didn't. And it went about 15 feet by. Yeah. <laughs> I would have liked to have rethought that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny how you get, you get overly in the moment, huh? Um, yeah. Well, um, this has been fun, guys. I really appreciate your time. Um, uh, you know, uh, Steve, this year, it's, you got to play some more at the end of the year? You got some tournaments coming up, anything? I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. we're down to nine events now. Um, yeah. It depends. If guys are afraid to travel, I'll get in all the fields. If guys, yeah. if everybody wants to play because we have a short season, I may not get in anything. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. How are you yeah. feeling about your game right now? Uh, I need to find a gym and get my body back in shape. <laughs> the game was pretty good. I mean, I played three times. I played – yeah, you did. You, 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 you yeah. your numbers are your numbers are pretty good. I was checking the first of the year. You, you know, you had a couple of couple of really two two out of three really solid tournaments, right? Yeah, and then you know, and I played hell, I played well for the first three to four weeks, and then lack of gym time has caught up with me. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that you're not the only one on that story. Yeah, uh, coach, what 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 do you say? Uh, well, he's got to get he's got to get uh, back at it as best he can. Hopefully, he gets an opportunity because I I still believe that he's capable of winning, even though he's uh, advanced age. Because he knows how to do it if he gets in the hunt. Exactly. And stuff. And uh, as for myself, I wish you'd move back down here so I could have a partner. Nobody will play with me anymore. <laughs> I know oh, you will. Because I will. I'll play with you. The best worst golfer team in the history of golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one year we should, we did, we did, we hit an alternate shot. We, 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 we played we somewhere like once. Four under it is in an alternate shot. Yeah, remember. exactly. Yeah. That's what we saw. Yeah. Out of, well, uh, well, it's been fun and, and I really appreciate your time and uh, Thank you. illuminating. I'm sure uh, for me, as usual, always picking up some nuggets somewhere and I hope to cross tabs with you guys soon. All right. Well, thanks, John. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. All right. We'll talk soon. Thank you very much.